So uh, my name is Ben Pollock. I'm uh, oh, I just turned 33. I'm five uh, eight. I uh, measured in. I actually did classic physique last year. Weighed in at 184 on stage, and I measured in at five eight and a quarter. So just barely made it there. And right now I'm weighing. I weighed 244.6 on my calibrated scale yesterday. So I think I'm a little bit lower than I'm probably about 242 right now. Uh, we are slightly, slightly depleting, depleting for a show this weekend, but right around that 240, 245 mark. Okay. Uh, go ahead and uh, take us through the workout today, bud. What you trained and what you like about your movement? Um, so today I trained legs. Uh, I am, I think I'm five days out right now, so it's probably a little too close to train legs, but um, this show was a little bit last minute, so I wasn't able to set up my schedule exactly how I like. So uh, generally my leg training is fairly low volume because I am, my legs are a strong point for me and I can move a lot of weight. So I end up, you know, for, for one set, I'll probably end up, one working set, I'll probably end up doing six or eight tra uh, warm up sets. So I, I still get a lot of volume in, but then in terms of like actual all out sets, it's pretty low. So. I always start my leg training with calves. I do that uh, for two reasons. One, because I don't want to neglect calves when I'm tired at the end of the workout. Um, but two, because when I squat, I use a lot of forward knee movement, right? So that, in, in, from a bodybuilding perspective, that gives you better quad activation. Uh, from a powerlifting perspective, for me, that helps me stay more upright, keeps my hips close to the bar, and gives me better leverages. So very important to have good calf mobility for that. Training calves first helps. Um, helps warm up the, that, the ankle area, the calf muscles, all that stuff. Uh, from there, I move on to hamstrings. If I were training for strength, I would not pre-exhaust my hamstrings before squatting for obvious reasons. Uh, but, you know, training for physique, uh, it can both help alleviate knee pain. And then also, again, you don't want to neglect, neglect hamstrings after you're wiped out from, from doing your heavier quad work. So I uh, did some sets on the uh, hamstring curl machine. I, I've been using a myo rep protocol. So if you're familiar with kind of rest pause training, it's very similar. You'll do a, a what's called an activation set of usually somewhere between 10 to 15 reps. And then you'll do mini sets where you rest 12 to 15 breaths, maybe about 20 to 30 seconds. And you'll do another set. And the second set should be about a third of the reps on your top set. So uh, today I did, I think it was 60 pounds on the hamstring curl. I did my first set of 10, uh, my second set of four. So a little bit more than 30, a little bit more than a third. Uh, and then I got a third set of two or three, I think. So um, you'll just keep going. You'll keep doing those mini sets until you can't. And I find that's a good way to train intensely and also accumulate more volume than you would with a traditional rest pause method. Uh, from there, we moved on to the leg press. I did some uh, just real light reverse band. I had four mini bands on there, which is probably taken off about uh, 15, 30 somewhere between 45 and 60 pounds at the at the bottom and then nothing at the top so uh, just a little less pressure on the knees at the bottom of the movement really helps me especially because you know usually uh, when you go to the bottom of a leg press you're going to transfer some of the some of the stress from your from your quads to your hips and so i find that can be helpful to to take just a little bit of that off uh, so i did the the set of leg press with the leg press i used a different protocol this one is more of a cumulative fatigue method. So what I'll do is I'll work up to a top set. Again, it'll be generally 8 to 12 reps. I'll do my set. Uh, and then I'll, I won't go to absolute failure on that. I'll try and stay within, within 1 to 3 reps of failure. Uh, and then I have a set time period to rest. So today it was 1 minute because I'm close to a show. I, I use shorter rest periods. So 1 minute rest, I'll do another set. And I'll keep doing that. Rest a minute, do a set until I can't get in my rep range. So today I got 2 sets of 10 and a set of 5. And... I didn't really track my PRs today. I didn't want to, again, I am slightly depleted, not terrible, but I'm fairly lean. Didn't want to get hurt. Didn't want to, you know, push myself by breaking numbers this close to a show. So I was happy with that work. It was hard. I stimulated my quads. That was enough for today. Uh, from there, I move on to my strength movement. Again, if I were training strictly for strength, this would probably be the first work, first movement in the workout after calves. Because I am training for hypertrophy, I like to put it a little bit lower, uh, a little bit later in the workout because the weight I can use is lower lessens the risk of injury but you're still going to train the target muscles very hard so for today that was a uh, a safety bar squat normally i wouldn't do that movement but um, again close to a show trying to do something different give my body a little bit of a rest i actually find doing different movements it can be a great way of almost deloading while still allowing you to train fairly intensely so uh, i did the safety bar squat i put in real light wraps and i worked up to i think it was 605 the bar is 65 i think Worked up to 605 for, uh, for a set of seven. I think, you know, had I been pushing it, I think I had 10, maybe 11 reps in there. Uh, but again, trying to keep it fairly conservative. I also like the, 
in, in terms of rep ranges, I have several that I'll work through. So if I'm doing a pure hypertrophy workout, it'll typically be eight to 12 to even 15 or 20 reps. Uh, when I'm training for both size and strength, I like to include some more work that's going to train uh, kind of your ability to grind with the heavy weight, which is very important for powerlifting, uh, your ability to uh, build those neuromuscular connections that you need to to activate all the muscles involved in a movement, not just the ones that you're targeting, right? So with a safety bar squat, you're getting activation from the glutes, the hamstrings, the back, uh, and the quads, not just the quads. So for those, it's more beneficial to use lower rep ranges. Seven to eight tends to be ideal for myofibril hypertrophy. Higher than that, you're really gonna get sarcoplasmic hypertrophy where you're building up the muscle volume, not so much the contractile tissue itself. So I was happy with that. Again, good weight. I don't know whether it's a PR or not. I'll, I'll probably check next week or something, but I really wasn't concerned about that today. And then I finished up with some glute ham raises. Uh, this is probably my number one favorite hamstring movement. Uh, it would fatigue me too much for the quad work, so that's why I put it last in the, in the session. But I feel like this really helps me to keep my hips engaged throughout an entire range of motion. Very important no matter what kind of movement you're doing. And then also stimulate the hamstrings with a, with a good amount of weight. So uh, that wraps it up for today. It was much shorter. I probably would have done... Uh, maybe another two sets of safety bar squats and another couple sets of glute ham raises had this been a, a full workout. Um, but because I do want to take it a little bit easier with, with my current uh, level of leanness, current goals, I decided to call it there. Yeah, so um, this was a big problem for me. I used to be very intimidated by the weight. Like anything that was not even a PR, right? Not, not necessarily something I'd never done before, but just something that was heavy for me where I knew I would have to work hard. I would get very anxious about that. And I know a lot of guys like that anxiety. It gets them amped up for the workout. It gives them motivation. But I actually found that it could interfere. It would, I would get so anxious about it that I would cut a rep short and not even attempt a set because I would be so scared. Not even necessarily of getting hurt, just about how difficult the set might be, about missing a rep, whatever the case may be. And so what I actually did to overcome that was start meditating. And I actually meditated twice a day, every day for a year. Uh, and, and that really helped me get over this. And what I'm trying to do during those minutes is really focus on my external environment. Um, so I'll focus, I'll begin with my breathing patterns, and then I'll listen to you know, the sounds around me, the smells, the feeling of my feet on the floor. That all helps to kind of ground and center me. It takes my mind away from the kind of task at hand, or the task that's coming up, and really helps me stay in the moment. And so I find that when I'm able to do that, not only does the anxiety go down, a whole lot I'm also able to devote more effort to an individual set because I'll get to a rep right instead of thinking you know you do the first rep a lot of times what will go through your head is man that was really hard there's no freaking way I'm gonna get 10 if you're just focused on that one rep and then the next rep and then the next rep you really never have that um, distraction is really what it is and so you're able or at least I'm able and this is gonna be very individual but I'm able to push myself significantly harder. I'm able to tackle heavy weights without, you know, getting amped up more than necessary. Uh, and I find that it's a really, really uh, beneficial way for me to train. The downside of this is that it does take up a lot of time. You know, it'll take me three or four minutes just to get centered like that. And then you also have your rest time, you're changing weights, all that stuff. And so for a pure hypertrophy workout, generally what I'll do is actually spend that meditation beforehand um, where I'll sit in my car for five or 10 minutes before I even step into the gym and I'll try and hold that mindset for as long as possible as I move through my sets. It's a, it's a different type of mentality and it's very challenging, uh, but I do find that this is something that has uh, made a, uh, a big difference in my ability to, uh, to lift productively. As most people would think if they saw you, they would think you're actually trying to get more intense, but you're actually trying to center yourself and kind of calm down. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yes. And, uh, um, and this is something that Dave Tate mentioned to me uh, at one point is that, you know, people look at my videos on Instagram where I'll cut that part out, right? And they'll just see me yelling and screaming and getting amped up. But really what I'll do is I'll try and uh, get amped up and then I'll try and bring myself down. And I try and find that middle ground right before I begin a set. And, you know, at first that was impossible. It was absolutely impossible. And uh, I've just been practicing it for, at this point, it's, I've been practicing it for about five, five or six years. And so it's almost second nature. And uh, it's, it's really never failed me. So I'm a big believer in it. Definitely, man. Well, that's very interesting. Like I said, a lot of guys don't do that. And if they do, I've seen people, you know, people slap each other and all kinds of stuff to get amped up. Yeah. Like the reversal. Right? Yeah. Are you visualizing kind of what you're going to do then, or is it not really? Specific? No, that's another thing is that, so I used to try and visualize every single workout, every single, you know, um, every single lift, every single rep. 
And what I found was uh, that, again, it got distracting. I would have so many things I was trying to remember when I was lifting, right? So, for example, in a squat, uh, my cues are, all right, I'm going to start with the weight over my heels. I'm going to shift some forward on my toes so I can get that, uh, you know, forward knee displacement. Um, really push my knees forward, keep my hips centered, keep my hips tight, keep the tension on my hips, keep my chest up, keep my lungs full of air. All those things, trying to think about all that in the middle of a rep. Well, you're not going to have that much mental energy to actually push through the rep. And so what I actually learned to do, and this was something from, uh, you know, one of my training coaches, Mike Desher, he told me instead of trying to visualize exactly what you're going to do, just try and remember the feeling, right? So anytime you can do a really good set, a really good rep, uh, what I would do is then go take a few minutes after the set and I would just sit down and then I would visualize, all right? So this is after the fact. I would walk through, again, replay in my head three or four times exactly how that set felt. And again, I'm not thinking verbally here. There's no words going through my head. I'm just trying to recreate the physical feelings. And this is something you can do with really any experience, but um, doing that allows you to really get all the benefits of visualization without a lot of the drawbacks. And there are, if you look at the academic research, there are a lot of drawbacks when it comes to visualization. Um, one of the big ones is that when you're visualizing something, generally what, you, what you'll do is you'll visualize the perfect day. Well, you're never going to have a perfect day. So as soon as a little thing goes wrong, you're totally out of your element. You feel lost. You don't know what to do because you've practiced a hundred times in your head. You've practiced this perfect day and all of a sudden it's not perfect and you don't have a contingency plan. So what a lot of the academic literature will tell you to do is instead of visualizing a perfect day, visualize how you're going to overcome adversity, right? Visualize how you're going to how you're going to respond when that first rep feels like crap and you have to re-rack the bar and take the whole set again. Visualize what you're going to do when, you know, the machine you want is taken and you have to find something else in the moment. Visualize how you're going to respond to that calmly, but intentionally, right? Not randomly. So that, that's kind of my approach to that. It's very interesting, but writing for people out there but who didn't know um, your beginnings and how you got started, like what got you into powerlifting and then eventually bodybuilding, like how you got into it, like interested about these? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like... It's a, it's a almost a meme right now or a stereotype, but I did get into lifting in uh, really sixth or eighth grade because I, I was kind of a small skinny kid, out of shape, nerd, and really wanted to, you know, be more, uh, be less socially awkward. And so uh, it was, my dad wouldn't let me lift until my, until I was in high school. So my first day of high school, I started lifting and he's just showing me how on this old bench that we have in the garage or something. And then when I... Once, once the semester picks up, I start wrestling that winter, and so I learn a lot from my wrestling coach, and I keep it up through high school, but it's not really until undergrad that I start getting serious about it. I roomed with a guy. His name was Bill. He had a, a junior world record in the APF, and uh, so he started a powerlifting club with Elite FTS, and uh, this was at the University of Virginia, and that's when I tr started to get serious about, about lifting, and so not competing, but lifting in general. So I came into college. I weighed about 130, and I graduated around 210, so... I grew quite a bit in undergrad, and then after I finished, you know, and lost that network at college, I uh, I found actually started competing in CrossFit. That lasted about one one competition, um, and then I moved on to Strongman, where I tore my bicep, so that that was out. And finally, uh, it, was, it was several years later, I started competing in powerlifting and did my first meet. And uh, first meet, I think, was November 2011 or 2012, uh, and then I finished fifth at Raw Nationals in 20. Yeah, so I started in 2011. Finished fifth at Raw Nationals the next year at 2012. Uh, did the Arnold in 2013. And then in 2015, I came in second at Raw Nationals. And uh, on 2016, then I started, my career started to take off. And I won Boss of Bosses. Uh, I won the U.S. Open, which was the the biggest money meet in history for powerlifting. And then I uh, I set a world record in the 198 class, the all-time total 198 of 2039. I Reebok record breakers that year. And that was, that was honestly my last really great powerlifting meet. Had some injuries after that, and uh, they they started uh, accumulating, you know, piling up to the point where I knew I needed to take a break. And so, last year I did my first bodybuilding show. I trained with John Meadows, classic. Uh, came in 184. Conditioning was on point, but I was just too small. So, after that, after I did North Americans that year, I came in tenth in my class, and then right after that, started working with Justin Harris. So that was uh, 11 months ago now, and I've put on or 10 months ago now, and I put on about. Uh, 60 pounds, right? So we're getting ready to do another show. I should come in 60 pounds of stage weight heavier at this one this weekend. That's awesome, man. What drew you into switching from powerlifting? What made you be like, 
I've always kind of been into the power lifting, power, power building kind of mindset. So when I first started right back in 2009, or 2005 to 2009 was when I was an undergrad, uh, Justin Harris was really, uh, Justin Harris, Matt Kroc, a lot of these guys who lifted raw were very much anomalies. Uh, you know, equipped lifting was in at the time, and I had no desire to shove myself into a tight suit to, to lift weights. I just wanted to look good and be really strong, and, and that's what these guys did. So I really looked up to them. and. That was always something I tried to maintain a pretty good physique throughout my powerlifting career. So bodybuilding had always been kind of a side interest of me, uh, of mine. I always had this idea in my head that it would be really cool to have a pro card, um, but never really enjoyed the training enough to to want to compete. And so, um, if I'm being totally honest, I still don't enjoy the training as, nearly as much as powerlifting. But um, it is a goal that allows me to push myself dip hard, to learn new things, to hopefully improve my strength levels as well. It has been the case so far. Uh, and, and hopefully extend my powerlifting career by, by switching back and forth between both. I actually have my PhD in the history of bodybuilding and powerlifting, and if you look back at some of the historical grades, that's very much what they did, was their off-season was bodybuilding, and then when they got in-season, they would periodize their training and slowly bring the reps down and the weight up, but uh, you know, for, for the majority of the time, they really did bodybuilding-style training, so I do believe there's a lot to be said for that, for, for training at least for both at, at different points in a, in a macro cycle, right, like in a span of a career. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm sponsored by a few companies. Really grateful for their support. Uh, Granite Supplements, owned by John Meadows. Uh, like I said, John coached me through my first show in Elite FTS, so they've been really great to me. Um, I do work with uh, Pioneer Fitness. They are uh, strictly a powerlifting company, but they do have equipment that can be helpful for bodybuilders. And uh, you know, Matt Hayden owns the company. He is one of the best human beings I've ever met. He's really genuinely concerned about the strength community, about the, you know, the, the community in general. And uh, so I, I really, really appreciate all of their support. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then obviously, you know, huge thanks to Justin for coaching me and to my, to my fiance, Stacy for, for all her support. Um, because, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, it's it's really stressful when you're when you're prepping for anything, any type of competition. It can, it can be really mentally hard. So, without that support system, I definitely definitely couldn't do it. So, and thanks to Jeff for the awesome video. <laughs>